good morning brothers and sisters and welcome to our St. George's Wednesday service. And today we're going to be looking at the very challenging words of Jesus uh, in Luke chapter 14. Let me read the passage for us and then lead us in prayer. Luke chapter 14 verses 25 to 33. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough? to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate, whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Let me lead us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that in your grace you call sinners to follow you as disciples. Help me now to preach your word with faithfulness and clarity. And would you change our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may count the cost of discipleship and be faithful to our Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, what should we expect of the Christian life? What should we expect of the Christian life? Life. Some Christians believe that the Christian life is one of continual blessing. Uh, we should expect success in our studies and our work. We should expect good health and a long life. We should expect riches and comfort. Uh, some Christians expect that the Christian life is a bit like an Air Asia optional add on. It's an extra hobby that we can add on if we have time. Uh, if we want, amidst all the busyness of business and family and fun. Perhaps an activity for Sunday morning, if there's nothing else pressing on. Well, some Christians expect the Christian life to be a life of victory. Victory over sin, triumph over opponents, and a life free of suffering. What should we expect of the Christian life? Well, in our passage today, Jesus gives us a very different picture of the Christian life. Not a life of comfort, uh, not an optional hobby, not a suffering-free life of victory. Rather, we see the Christian life is one of sacrifice, of suffering, of service, a life that will be costly and will demand of us everything. In Luke chapters 9 to 19, Jesus is journeying to the cross. He is teaching his disciples what it means to follow him. And firstly, we see this morning that Jesus demands our total allegiance above everything else. Jesus demands our total allegiance above everything else. Look at verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus' words here are radical and challenging. It's tempting to water them down as if Jesus doesn't mean what he actually says here. And Jesus is using stark language called hyperbole to make a bold statement. He is demanding that he be number one in our lives. 
Now, of course, Jesus doesn't mean here that we should literally hate our families. Uh, elsewhere, he commands us to honor our father and our mother, to love our neighbor, indeed, to love our enemies. But he knows our tendency to put other things ahead of him, particularly our family. And so Jesus demands that he be number one. First above our parents, first above our children, first above our siblings, first above ourselves. And he tells us if we cannot put him first, we cannot be his disciples. Of course, normally honouring parents will mean that we seek their wisdom. Normally loving our children will mean that we prioritise their needs. But Jesus reminds us here, if our parents say, I don't want you to be baptised, well, Jesus must come first. Or if they say, you can't be a doctor or a lawyer, you can be a doctor and a lawyer, but you can't be a pastor. Well, Jesus must come first. If they, if they say, you, you, uh, you must prioritise your studies, your work, of a church, Jesus must come first. And Jesus knows well, uh, full well, that in a patriarchal society like his and like ours, putting Jesus first in this way will often be interpreted in very negative terms, disrespect to our parents, despising their wisdom, perhaps even that we hate them. But Jesus demands our total allegiance over everything else. And if he must be first above our family, then surely Jesus must take precedence over the immoral demands of a boss, or the approval of our friends, or the comfort of our lifestyle. He must be first above our ambitions, above our hobbies, above our desire for popularity, above everything. No part of our life can be off limits to Jesus. He demands that all of it be brought under his rule. Verse 34 says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now when Jesus speaks here of taking up our cross, he's not thinking of the aches and pains of life or a difficult job or a challenging family situation, as we often say. We've all got to carry our cross. No, there's only one time that someone will take up a cross, and that is as they walk to their crucifixion. And so when Jesus says we must bear our cross, he is actually saying we must go to our death. He is not talking literally about going to our death, although, of course, some Christians do die for their faith. He's saying we must count ourselves dead. We must give up control of our lives. We must give up control in every area so that we no longer live for ourselves. But for him, our old life is dead. Verse 33 summarizes it well. Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. He's saying it's impossible. It's impossible to be a Christian. It's impossible to be a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you are willing to allow Jesus to be Lord over every part of your life. You see, Christianity is not a hobby that I squeeze in when I have time. And Jesus is not a wise teacher whose advice I can take it or leave it. And Jesus will not allow us to have him as our saviour, but not as our Lord. Jesus is God's universal, eternal king, and he demands that we bow before him, that we live his way for his glory, no matter what the cost. Jesus demands our total allegiance above everything else. Now, I would not be surprised if that makes you feel a little uncomfortable, that uh, Jesus' words are rather extreme or radical. I certainly feel the weight of those words myself. In the following verses, Jesus encourages us to count the cost of discipleship. We must count the cost of discipleship. Verse 28, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. 
Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and he's not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The point of those two stories is simple. Before you start building a tower, you must estimate the cost. Do you have enough money to finish it? And before you go to war, you must consider the likely casualties. Is this a battle I will win or lose? Is it worth it? And having counted the cost, you will decide whether to build or not, whether to fight or to surrender. Now, Jesus is saying the same is true in the Christian life. If we are to finish the Christian life, then we must first count the cost. Because if we do not first count the cost of following Jesus, we may not finish the Christian life in the end. Now, there are many uh, who are told that if they become Christians, that God will bless them and prosper them in all that they do in this life. He'll heal them of all their diseases. He'll rescue them from all their troubles so that they follow Jesus without counting any cost. They count the blessings. And so when the time of trouble and testing inevitably comes, and it will come, when they become sick or lose their job or face a relationship breakdown or rejected by their family or, or something else, they give up on the Christian life. They think, how could God have allowed this to happen? I thought he prom promised to bless me. Does he not love me? And the problem is that they had a wrong expectation for the Christian life in the first place. They didn't count the cost. And so they weren't able to finish. What about you? Have you counted the cost of discipleship? It's very important that you know what you signed up for. When you become a, became a Christian, if you're considering become a Christian, know what it will cost you. Jesus demands your total allegiance in every part of life. He wants to be first above your family, above your work, above your comfort, your hobbies, your dreams, everything. Well, as we finish, if it is so costly to follow Jesus, then why do it? Well, there are two reasons. Firstly, Jesus does not call us to do anything that he has not done himself. See, Jesus denied himself. Jesus took up his cross and he did it for us. He left the glories of heaven and he faced the shame and agony of the cross for us. He took our sins in our place. He gave up his life for us in love. He, he, he won for us eternal life. He allowed us to enjoy God's eternal blessings. Our Savior is truly worthy of our total allegiance. He is a good Savior. And he bought us with his life. Well, secondly, we should follow Jesus, because the cost of rejecting Jesus is so much more than the cost of following him. Back in a few chapters earlier, Luke 9 verse 24, Jesus says this, Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? See, if we reject Jesus' rule, if we hold on to our lives, Jesus says on judgment day we will lose our life. We will face eternal judgment away from the presence of God. Now, Jesus says, do the maths, run the sums. It's far more logical to give up temporary things for eternal blessings. It's worthless to have all that this world offers and lose your soul. 
in eternity, the cost of following Jesus is far less than the cost of rejecting him. So what should we expect of the Christian life? Not a pain-free life of comfort. Not an optional extra when we have time. Not a life of victory and success but a life of total allegiance to Jesus Christ, where he takes precedence over everything else, we should expect a life that will be costly, but a life that will gain eternal life in the end. Or have you counted the cost of following Jesus? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the price Jesus paid to save us from our sins. Help us to count the cost of following him, that we may give our lives to him in total allegiance above everything else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.